Hello and welcome to the New World Review. I'm Grand Line Waifu and I am not as beefy as other characters in this series, but you know what? I can pack a punch of deeply thought out opinions on Hunter Hunter while tapping my subscribe button. See, I can be just like both Bisky and Hiski, who are, let's be honest, our heroes and role models of this sh Okay, no, I can't even suggest that. Don't be like them, that's an awful idea. Don't you get mad at me, you two are absurdly dangerous people. Let's ignore their looks of disapproval and talk about them instead as we get into episode 72 and 73. Episode 72 and we're closing in on crunchy roll time. The back and forth cutting between Segueras and Gon trying to learn a technique was great up to a point. The jumps told us that something important is happening or about to happen, but it didn't tell us how long it would take, which meant that as the episode continued, I felt increasingly tense about the entire situation. That said, the increased nothingness that was happening, Kiwa and Bisky's relaxed sort of air to it all, and Gon's inability to progress at all sort of broke that tension like that testy pop that I just had. It, it, it all just broke. The issue was that we went from Segueras, who I feel takes himself far too seriously, I, I think it's the eyebrows probably, to gone failing, Bisky standing by and Kilwa sitting around. While I understand that Kilwa can't actually do anything because his hands are recovering, and I understand that Bisky does actually need to stand by, and I understand that there's little she can do to speed things along now that that's been explained, instead of the characters actually taking up new positions or even just frowning a little or really doing anything that shows the importance of what they're doing, they took up what I'm going to call their base cell positions. By which I mean, if they were drawn, on average, this is probably what they'd look like. You know, Zagera's always looks intense and broody, Kilwa's always chilling in a relaxed, casual position, and Bisky's always standing by. The fact that we spent what felt like half the episode in that repeated holding pattern grew visually boring. And that's somewhat frustrating because the circumstances are actually incredible. We have a group of psychopaths chasing after people with a moral code. Those people with a moral code are doing everything they can to give mini psychopaths time to develop skills and plans to stop the bigger psychopaths. We have a crying businessman. We have gone not yet able to do a thing he will be able to do when he suddenly and probably in the next episode finds exactly the right metaphor to characterize what the thing is. <sighs> we have broody moral man about to die, probably because he has no help from the crying boss that just cancelled the entire project and we have set up for the next arc just crouched on the ground with Kilwa's brother, apparently Kaluto, joining the Phantom Troop while Hiski lovingly strokes his telescope. Watch out, Kaluto. What is it with Kilwa's family that they just show up in places for a moment and, you know, probably disappear again? There is, in sum, so, so very much happening in this episode, but it felt underplayed and I am grumpy about it. I love that we're being reminded periodically that they're there. Their care for Krollo is still astounding because it's something that feels more wholesome than I'd really like to see it as, and I dream of the day Krollo gets his powers back, then berates them soundly for actually bothering to go through all that rather than living to his ideals and just continuing the truth. They're a close-knit bunch, and pink hair puppet lady really just helped Hisoka's telescope reach its full length by telling him she would hunt him down if he killed her boss. Beyond the adorable nature of the troop, it's also a good reminder that Hiski said to call him if they need, and that for all his complications in the way he acts, Hiski's quite a straightforward person with straightforward motives. For all his weirdness, he refuses to let Gon die until he's got what he wanted out of him, which is a full potential battle worthy of a schwing. Does Hiski plan on sword fighting Gon? Okay, okay, let's not answer that, despite the obvious and immediate image it brought to mind. And you know what? I'm not at all sorry. To distract you from all that, let's talk about Bisky's preoccupation with being right. How does that power work? How can a special technique be that of massage? I guess she's the closest this world has come so far to a healer. She has the power of relaxation on her side, and you know what? In a world where everyone's trying to kill everyone else or find things, maybe a good hunter can find out information if they use a good massage technique. Maybe it turns out the massage therapist she conjures can break spines or does acupuncture too and paralyze it. No, it really doesn't look as though that's what the power does. It truly really looks like her power is what I would probably realistically have as a power. That's a point. In the comments, which I'll actually read this time, let me know what kind of power you would have and what it would be based on. I feel like that seems fun and I'm sure everyone's thought about this, so like, let's have that conversation. As we step into the real world, going back to the episode, as we step into the real world, it's a whole new game for Bomber, but it also has a whole new set of implications for Gon. This is the first time, maybe, probably, I think, that Gon has been in a situation where the outcome almost has to be lethal. The Bombers aren't going to let their cards go without a fight. The ability they have mean they can't be disarmed, and until the game is done, Gon can't just tie them up and get what he's 
aiming to get. They're indiscriminately killing everyone now, and if Gon isn't powerful enough to kill them or overwhelm them in some way, I'm not sure how they'll move forward and finish the game. It also feels as though it's the end of the road for Sagueras, and I have a sneaking suspicion Bomber may have touched Mr. Batera or someone they care about. Either that, or Krollo's there and has said something, or Karapika's boss has been in contact with them through Neon. I, I get a sort of suspicion that whatever's wrong with Mr. Batera is linked to one of our other threads, so let's get into episode 73 and find out what. Note, I was wrong. Opening with Sagueras not returning is actually fantastic. Their time is up and it gives us so much to think about during the intro. The arc is getting close to the end and we get all the information we need about how tense things are from how focused the other two are on that information. That Gon is studying something else now is interesting. All their eggs are supposedly in the Gon basket. Even once they'd spoken to Goreno, Gore Gorinu, Gorinu, Gor, Gor, even once they'd spoken to, you know, spiky hair guy, even once they'd spoken to Gorinu, there was a belief that everything was on Gon. Looking back from the end of this episode, I was definitely wrong in that. I was also wrong in thinking Batera's tears were related to anything other than the actual game. His story was heartbreaking, but because I wasn't particularly attached to the game as a concept, nor did I really get time to think about what each individual card did or how it worked, despite knowing the game finishers got to take cards into the real world, I didn't have any big emotions related to finding out that he was specifically after Breath of Archangel. Nor did I have any particular connection to him. It totally makes sense and it's nice to have a motive for him, but I don't care. Which is odd. I cared more about the NPCs in the game than I do about him, probably because it just didn't seem important at any point up to now. It's good that Togashi decided to tie up that loose end. We needed for that to happen, but I also would have actually preferred to see what Sagero's response was. Knowing that he no longer needs to finish the game, yet also knowing that there are people in the that he's made a deal with. He seems the sort to be moralistic enough to at least consider the implications of not needing to return to the game, even getting a message back into it somehow. If we don't see Sagueras again, I feel like that's a bit of a loss of character development I would actually have liked to see. The fakes and the card switcheroo was a great tie-in and a great way to make sure the tension stayed on the importance of this plan and the battle, but still. Speaking of the plan, we jumped around in people's minds this episode. We got to see, I think, everyone's perspective on how they thought the situation was going and I loved it. There is a great focus when we jump around through perspectives that we really didn't get when the characters were physically jumping around last episode and I appreciate this, especially since the plan to separate meant that I first got mad at Gone for going off plan because every time. Gon is given a plan he wanders away from. But then to see Bisky and Kilwa doing what they do best? Um, Biscuit, we need to talk. I remember saying a while back that Bisky looked too young for her stated age and that if she'd been as young as all that, there would have been different reactions. But to know she's actually super strong and really big and that it's all a choice is astounding. The level of Nen she must be using to maintain that change when she's around everyone all the time is incredible. And that it's all due to personal preference is just so totally Bisky. I love it. What it doesn't do is give us a full understanding of the extent of Bisky's powers and I am suddenly refocused on her as a character. I want to know why didn't her hair grow with her? Why didn't her clothes shred? Ah, speaking of clothes, actually, when did Kiowa get his usual outfit back? I know it's a small detail and I'm sure it's inconsequential and there have been a lot more important things happening, but I suddenly realized he has his full outfit back and I demand to know when this happened. Jumping to Kiowa's fight, because Bisky's ended very quickly and easily after her reveal, it was great overall to see him plan and trapping sequentially. His mind is his greatest power, and while I believe Gon is closer to Hisoka in terms of combat philosophy, Kilwa's probably closest to Hisoka in execution. Kilwa's enjoyment of tricking and trapping and testing things on his opponents is something I could well imagine Hisoka doing. And the fact that neither Bisky nor Kilwa actually wanted to show these abilities to the others in their group, the fact that only Gon has shown his powers to the others says a lot about how they interact with the world compared to the way that he does. He can hide his abilities, as we know. He hasn't shown Bomb or everything he can do, and we're waiting for exactly the right moment to get to that. But he's a lot more of an open book while not actually being an open book at all. And yes, that's a contradiction, but hear me out. Going into Gon's head in this episode is the first significant time we've done so since the Hunter exam, I think. We don't see the world from Gon's perspective very often at all. We see it from Biskies, Hiskies, almost every enemy, and everyone trying to understand the kid, but we really don't see things from his perspective. And that means a lot of what we think about Gon is unverifiable. I can't pin down his motives for sure, because all we have is what he says verbally or how he acts, not how he thinks 
or what he thinks. So everything is a guess or externally driven narrative of the character, which is a fantastic way to avoid pinning down your main or dropping new information on us. Ultimately, we underestimate Gon as much as his opponents do, which is why I'm always confused by what exactly makes his head steam or what decisions he's making, because on the surface he's a simpleton, maybe. But when you get a little deeper, he knows what he's doing, or at least he knows what he should be doing and how it should be done, but he actively chooses not to do things that way. And because we have so little time inside his head, we don't know why he's not doing things that way, other than what he's verbally saying to others, which might not be the truth or accurate on a very deep level. And on that, we know that now the real battle begins. We skipped through each of the scenes of underestimation to get to this point, the point before Bisky and Kilwa can get back to Gon. What will he do and how will he react? And on that, the end frame of this episode is beautifully composed with the bright red of the hand while the physically imposing larger bomber with ice hidden behind glasses and sharp lines dives towards Gon, whose musculature is now showing very clearly. Everything about the image tells us that whatever trap they've set is work and Gon's hopefully going to make a fantastic comeback. As Bisky said, he can survive more than one explosion. He's not like the others. Bomber has yet to realise that. He also has yet to realise that Gon is the most stubborn character I have ever seen in an anime. Not just in determination, but in sheer stubbornness. He wants to find his dad. To do that, he has to win the game or finish it. He's going to do that. I would have no doubt that he's going to do that. The next episode is going to be a juicy battle, I hope. And because I want to get there, I'm going to sign off here because that's it from me. If you enjoyed this discussion and want to see more, you can click here, here and here. There's also a Discord and a range of other things here and here. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.